So would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? Um, my name's Daniel Shadbolt. Um, I'm a painter. Um, I'm English. I'm 43. Um, and I locate my own painting in a within a tradition that um, is largely a French tradition from 19th century painting, a European tradition that's uh, concerned with atmospheric colour is what I would describe it as. So the roots are probably in Impressionism and Expressionism, and they go through artists like Bouillard and um, Giacometti and somebody. So I'm going ahead too quickly, but the uh, there's a painter recently who I really want to see his paintings, um, who only died in 2017, um, Jack Drufamus. Um, and uh, he, yeah, his uh, his paintings look very much alive to me. And um, yeah, maybe I should try that again. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, so Dan, the I love your work, and I mean it's so varied how uh, you're painting as well. So figurative painting, portraiture, um, still life, landscape. Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. You've got such a distinctive style, and that style is applied to all of those different subjects. Where did you train? What was your creative journey? And um, mm. how long did it take to sort of develop your style? Um, well, yeah, I'm 43, so I've been out of art school about 20 years now. Um, my degree in painting was at Chelsea College of Art. I started in 2000. I'm from Hertfordshire, I should have said, from Welling Garden City. So I moved to London and did my degree. And um, Chelsea had great visiting tutors and a lot of painters that have stayed, really stayed with me. Uh, one of which I wanted to talk about today was Lucy Jones, um, whose, whose paintings, a lot of landscape painting quite, large scale very bold and um i think of her work recently when i attempt to be bolder myself which you know if i've for instance gotten into working in sort of foot square or two feet size then i to get out of that um sort of bracket if you like and to paint from the you know using your shoulder your arm your shoulder rather than your hand and wrist is a it's a good thing and um so that was Chelsea well it wasn't Chelsea there was loads of painters there um Chantal Joffe Hay Donaghy um painters Chantal Joffe said to trust the paint which um stayed with me also to not you know not try to over um overdo something well um let me come back <laughs> um Chelsea was sort of huge opening up of the world for me because meeting people from um all different backgrounds and um you know I, I probably was in a bit of a cultural um vacuum I hadn't been to London very much and I didn't grow up with art um so Chelsea really opened things up and, you know, the enthusiasm, the ambition and the people that I, that I was sharing studios with, um, really, really interesting and, um, committed, um, artists. Uh, so after Chelsea, I got into the Royal Drawing School that it was called the Prince's Drawing School then. And I did the drawing year, which was one year of, drawing every day all sorts of subjects and very much uh, taught in the manner of the artists that you would do a class with they were teaching their connection with the visual world through their own work so everyone was different and you um you could absorb as much as you wanted of this um well it's 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 like another world, isn't it? This experience of art. Everyone has this shared time spent painting or doing something creative and um, talking about it is 
tricky because um you know paint is is stuff isn't it yeah uh, and so to get a handle on it i i i didn't grow up you know i I've, I've definitely struggled with um articulation you know um but i read a lot when i was younger and uh absorbed as much as i could so i was quite uh, the drawing school was good in the sense that it did nurture its alumni you we got some experience of teaching by um doing what was called the drawing clubs teaching the drawing clubs so young artists and for a couple of years that was really um insightful because you really related to these young adults and could see their um openness towards things and their attention was it was really um great to find that um it's a basic thing isn't it you know we, we, if you think of everyone doing their own work it's all it's all going forwards and everyone's kind of parallel to each other just trying you know and and it's only the trying that matters so that's the that's what jack and said that the, um, so let me. That was two thousand and four. So since then, I did some technician work, where I was setting up life glass and um, drawing alongside. I always did other jobs, but I only became self-employed until about until I only became self-employed in two thousand and seven. Um, so I suppose the business side of painting has been a gradual. I suppose it's fifteen years. 16 now of um gradual um climatization to something that's not um it's not instinctive like yeah. painting is you know um, and to continue painting it's kind of like doing monkey bars or something you know it's one <laughs> rung and then the other you just you just carry on and yeah. um you know this gradual dawning of a of a business world out there where people are mapping things and doing quarterly um assessments and yeah. <laughs> analysis. Especially nowadays I think as well that the you know where it used to be a professional artist taking on yeah. a, you know a gallery commercial. or two and now you have to be your PA or media um department, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. One man band. Yeah. Yeah. So you te- you're teaching now. Yeah, so- I got I started teaching and at the same place that I teach in 2008. It kind co- coincided with I tried to get into a few of the society um FBA uh Federation of British Artists um society exhibitions so that's the New English Art Club, the Royal Society of Portrait Painters, the Royal Institute of Oil Painters. Um, the RBA, uh, so they all happen in the mall galleries, and that that was a little lifeline, really, because I would apply, and you know whether or not get success. It was a gradual thing where we sort of slowly learnt. Oh, this is happening again this year. Okay, I'll try for that, and you know you get a thicker skin and you navigate. Um, it's all decisions, isn't it? Just one decision after another. Um, what did you just ask me about about teaching? So you, do yeah, you I teach got the Royal Society of yeah. Portrait Painters bursary for um, it's called the Bulldog Bursary for Portrait Painting, mm-hmm. and that was two thousand and eight. And I luckily started teaching at Heatherley's in Chelsea that year. Um, I was introduced by another artist and. It's it's been again. You have to learn when you know. I guess any job you learn a little bit to start with, and so I've been teaching there about fifteen years. Um, so that's that's um, it's. I mean, I've, I probably have let go of a few classes to. Take spend a bit less time teaching than I did in the past, which has felt like a relief after about ten years or so. It felt like I was, you know, running a bit 
low. You know, yeah. I felt like if I didn't try to do something myself, then I couldn't advise because I was losing the um, contact with yeah. art, with painting. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting because I teach as well it, independently, but. Um, you know, various workshops and classes and online as well and it's always such a fine balance to strike because and I found this when I was doing my fine art degree as well but a lot of the, the full-time lecturers mm. when they showed their work it was maybe from 10 years beforehand because yeah. They, they kind of lost touch with their own practice because the teaching had take, taken over. And I find this now where I have to have a real balance between the two. The painting must mm. be sort of dominant and then the teaching as part of it. Because if you, like you say, if you lose mm. connection with your own yeah. practice, it's very difficult to then teach. Yeah. Do you find that? Yeah, because you you know you, you have to have the hope, and if you don't have the hope with your own practice, yeah. it's hard to sort of just disseminate the word, you know, to pass it out, to, yes. to send it out the message of hope, and to encourage and um, yeah, you're spurring on other people in the same activity, and it's it's great really because um, yeah, well, you maybe I said said too much, you go. Uh, no, you t- you did great. It's it's been it's been good because of the variety of people that I've met through teaching, and I try to paint in the class, which um, I didn't always do, but it helps me to not not um, you can sort of stumble into this position of authority, and you know this sort of aloof. Um, yeah. power floating about the room and decreeing that you know somebody's painting should be more like this or more like yeah. that and you know it's it's hard enough to actually get done with it you know I, um, I've got a board of feeling words here to read every now and again and one of them is disorientated so frequently painting is a disorientating experience and you you yeah. start off think maybe with an objective I'm going to do this but within um, minutes you can lose yes you know it all falls apart and so the, the something like still life I've sort of clung to it um, I started with on the second year of my degree um, looked at Shard and, and thought and, you know there's something something in this uh, idea of looking at something a lot and you know trying to remake it over and over and over and mm. and it's it's um it's pretty crazy behavior <laughs> yeah well I, I think with this the still life thing it is interesting like you mentioned Shardan there and um I read a book, I think it was Alan de Botton, um, wrote this book about Marcel Proust. And he, Marcel Proust, the writer, was sort of obsessed with yeah. Chardin, you know, to how he would sort of just like meditate upon these things um, mm. in the still life. I paint still lives every now and then, and I find them fascinating because, first of all, the thing is, it's not permanent, if, especially if you're working with yeah. a fruit or flowers yeah. or something like that, that you're, you're sort of capturing this moment in time mm-hmm. and transcribing that through that language of paint. Yeah. I do find it quite a meditative process in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it, it's very, um, it's something quite intimate and solitary about it as well. Normally, yeah. I paint these vast landscapes, but every yeah. now and then you you, yeah. you have that. So, do, do you like painting still lives? Yeah, definitely. It's um, I mean, the painting process. I although the think, kind of painting varies, I don't divide it. It's a similar varying state of absorption, concentration, and just battling. You know, you um, I, I. 
I take longer between bits of, you know, uh, I will think more between stages of painting and the painting time, time spent painting can be less, but the, um, so I'm looking at a landscape now that's just really gotten started, maybe two days of painting, and the, it's, it's a bit like, what I want to say is it comes up clearly in painting from memory. You know, if you're trying to paint a place from memory, and you know that I suppose I think of the landscape as mainly being about the sky and the land and the division between them and that sort of horizon distance. That's the that's the thing that attracts me to it because you stand in front of a canvas and you push a colour and then try another one and it's you position yourself in the in in between those two marks of colour and you know how does that place even exist? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 so um I can't think of the word for it, but it's it's transformative because you you know you want to do something you have to you know you have to carry on and adjust something about the relationship of color but where you get the ideas from and you know how you trust your intuition and change things it's it's very um there's a lot of the unknown you know yeah you know could you could argue that it's how oh, you've done that 20 times or something so surely there must be an element of predicted predictability in I'm looking at a couple of paintings now thinking well actually you can base a painting on another painting but the process opens up somewhere along the way and it has to open up doesn't it to scale is another thing you know I got a picture up there that I did eight years ago and I was actually on the beach and it was winter and the sea's very far away there's a time it's quite a big picture but the band of from the waves breaking and the horizons, really narrow. So it's mostly that foreground of this mm. dark beach with, um, and I remember the scale shifting while I was trying to paint it. And by scale, I mean, you know, how much, if you measured on the beach with two posts, like the um, lifeguards flags, you know, how, what distance would that cover on the beach? Let's say it started off as 60 meters or something, but, what I became aware of when I was painting is I was pushing it away within the composition. And so I was stretching that range, you know, so it was more like a hundred meters or something like that. And that uh, messing about with image, it's, that's, that's where I, I want to be, you know, that's, that's what mm. I want to do with my yeah. time. So that's the kind of arena in, in which you work. And I see it, whether it's in your landscape, just still like all your figurative stuff. There's this yeah. you you can see the history and I talk about this a lot. Yeah. So the yeah. history of the process is shown yeah, in the painting. And I love that yeah. about your work that you, you kind of see where you're you're sort of mapping things out and mm. leaving bits, balancing bits out. It's it's fascinating. Yeah. I always like that about other painters mm. in the past growing growing up. I I'm thinking of one Dermot Kelly. Um, okay. He yeah. often leaves this groundwork surrounding the image, and yeah. that I really enjoyed seeing that. Was it um, when you're trying to paint? It's kind of educational, isn't it? It's, it? It is. It is. You know, and what, it, yeah. The layer cake, layer structure. Um, yeah. And it's very different to, and I think this is why I was always drawn to um, say constables oil sketches because mm. the the academy at the time would demand these sort of highly finished highly polished paintings yeah. where you can't see the beginning or the ending of them in yeah. a technical sense apart from you know that they're these sealed kind of yeah. units but when you look at yeah. constables oil sketches they've got what we were talking about there they've got this yeah. rawness and that the whole history of the making in them 
Mm. I, I just find it so inspirational like that because as painters we can see much more. Yeah, than... and isn't it um, intriguing how he did the large scale studies? You know, yeah. I think the VNA have um, one that you know it's it's very. There's not a lot of color in the picture, and the handling is very broad. So. Yes. It has a feeling like it's very rapid, and um, and so to see that alongside the exhibition picture is, um, it's you kind of it kind of is confusing because you don't know what necessarily you prefer because there's there's great great quality in both. Um, you know, if you get up close to the hayway and, and see those fields, and you it's so um real yeah and yeah and rewarding you know the more you look the more you're seeing that's the um wonderful thing you know constable just had such a um technique and application yeah Yeah, incredible do do you think as well because i mean you you do have a kind of impressionistic way of painting that yeah. um, you can see the uh, lineage or the di- direct line between say Constable's oil sketches and then um, Impressionism so how the you know mm. the, the brush strokes the marks the broken colours yeah, are definitely. becoming much more um, of an yeah. element I mean, of a- it, I remember looking at Rembrandt and thinking you know, there's abstract expressionism in here. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's. I guess that's the um, unique uh, beauty in painting and how it's, it's always changing. It's always different, but there's something continuous within it. Mm, absolutely, mm. Simon. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, is there anything you can talk about with regards to how? You have this very delicate application of uh, midtones just balancing beautifully yeah. among each other, and I really appreciate how well they sit together. And is there anything that you either teach about that, or you can talk about with regards to your process and an understanding of how to achieve that? Really? Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. It's, I guess, you're underplaying contrast, and. Um, I I will acknowledge a shadow or that idea of the brightest bright and uh, darkest dark, but I will I won't want to overstate it because I always want the option to be able to push the the, the tone darker or lighter, um, and I find it kind of I guess I'm attracted to it in other paintings this level you know this un- unification of a surface if, if it's not contrast is one thing that you can I, I've, I've definitely underplayed in order to um, I suppose it's an attempt at control in some way so that when you decide when you're ready to make a accent or um, an emphasis and then then I would uh I'd just be gradual about it. And I, I do, that does come across in the teaching, definitely. It's, you know, maybe it's become a habit. Um, maybe I, I suppose it's, here's something, hair, highlights in hair, that's something in teaching that comes out. And I'm remembering um, saying this to people studying on the portrait diploma, I think that, it's when you notice something being becoming lighter, the immediate sort of response is to go to the white. But the, I mean, one piece of advice I had at college was to use Naples yellow rather than white, and that was softer and less um, dramatic. Or, uh, yeah, the light within a dark area might not be 
might not even approach sort of midway on a tonal range. Um, I, yeah, tone is definitely is something that the New English Art Club, when since I joined, of, I mean, they have a a sort of it's not quite a manifesto, but it's an idea about what the artists in it, you know, the values that they share, perhaps, and it's one of those is the importance of the tone and the um, working from from life to to some extent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you asked about tone, and I'm definitely like middle of the road, you know, middle of the road. So they're not the fast lane. Of, actually, I probably am the slow lane, really. I don't really drive. <laughs> there's a real harm. There's a real harmony in the, and I think your your mixing of colours again. You you can see the workings out in the paintings, and that's that's such an interesting and fascinating thing. And seeing as we're talking about tone and colour um, yeah. what colour palette do you use do you have the yeah. same well I wrote it out the list of colours that I use a lot of and then um, so I'll just run through it's tone in white I do have zinc white but not so much um, genuine Naples yellow light cadmium yellow pale aureolin yellow it's also known as cobalt yellow Indian yellow so that's the yellows, as well as yellow ochre or raw sienna. The reds, cadmium red, rose dore, and cardinal red, and alizarin crimson. Um, and for example, of the earth reds, I've got others, but I've put Indian red, English red, and Venetian red. Um, ultramarine and cobalt blue. I, I'm running very low on cobalt blue, and it's a daily anxiety <laughs> because I find it um if I'm using it I'm happy and if I'm not using it I'm aware that I'm I haven't right. got cobalt blue so that's right. pretty important and um, so then with indigo sometimes so greens I would use a lot of cobalt green deep emerald green viridian um tevert obviously ivory black, and raw umber, I didn't use it for many years, and it's the the appeal is increasing on me. Um, mm. I, I was looking this morning, because I thought we would talk about colour, and I was interested to see, I've got two tubes, one is cobalt green, and one is cobalt green deep, and one's old Holland, and one's Michael Harding, and I thought I'd look at the label to check that pigment, and they're different pigments, but one mm. uses... Pigment green 50, I think, and one was, I won't go and check, but it was a, a number in the teens or the 16 or 18. So, so yeah. that, you know, it's, it's a whole other world, isn't it, looking into the yes. pigments and, and Absolutely. the qualities. Yeah, and those different things. So sometimes... So I, I won't use all of those. You know, I'll, I'll probably use five or six colours, maybe eight. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's interesting with it you said about the pigments and cobalt pigments. So um, mm. cobalt turquoise is interesting because Windsor and Newton cobalt turquoise is like PG50 something. Mm. But um, the ones by, I think it's Gambling and uh, I'm trying to think of the other make, American make, use PB28. Which Williamsburg? Is, um, it, no, who who was it again? It's um, the one with walnut oil. I, I'll find out anyway. But okay. but it's um, let me just have a quick just have a quick look because it's um, good to talk about it. But anyway, yeah. the the PB twenty eight pigment, which is the same as um, a normal cobalt blue, yeah. it's not PB twenty eight, but it's so um, it's so beautiful and different in tone so let's just have a look sorry i'll be with you in a second um okay so m graham m graham paints and yeah, um i haven't heard of them yeah they're jackson mm -hmm. sells them they're really really mm -hmm. nice and it's made with walnut oil mm -hmm. but for 
difference between those pigments is is yeah. incredible. So you know, PB fifty, PB twenty eight, and mm. um, it, just the mixes you can get off off those. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, Dan, you were saying about the uh, Naples yellow, the yeah. genuine Naples yellow. Yeah. Um, which brand is that? It's Michael Harding. Yeah, you know, you've been using because it's it. You know, it it is like light in a tube. It just mm. um, lifts everything without uh, loss of saturation. So it's pretty useful. Yeah, is it lead? That's lead based, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you can. I mean, the the Winsor and Newton. Naples yellow, which is a hue, basically. I mean, yeah. it's, it's closer to sort of a raw sienna or something like that. I've, yeah. I've yet to use the Michael Harden, and, and, uh, but would like to. Yeah, the thing to watch out for is whether the tube is a mixture of white and yellow, isn't it? And if, yeah. you, if that's that's the telling sign. Um, but, you know, I don't always use it. Probably because of its expense, I, I quite I think cadmium yellow pale is the most versatile one. Okay. But for a long for a long time, probably ten years, I put it down to three colours. To probably because I wasn't I would buy the big tubes, but I they weren't high series colours. So that palette that it was quite dark as a palette. My yellow was Indian yellow, Michael Harding, that had I thought it was quite versatile. So you mm. could get good lights from it. But the dark, the depths were there because of its tone, um, even though it's very warm. That's the thing that makes me not go to use it now, is it's incredibly warm. Yes. So Indian yellow, alizarin crimson and ultramarine were that that was sort of I felt like that was the base palette. So for a long time, if I had those, um I felt like things are possible. So. Mm. They're all quite transparent colours. Those, yeah, those, they are. You are yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. The in, I use Indian yellow quite a bit as well, and yeah. I use the, the one from Jackson's Art Supply. So I think it's the same, uh, the professional one. I think it's the yeah. same pigment as the Michael Hard one, yeah. but it's just an incredible colour. I mean, all you need yeah. is a little bit of white, and it is so yeah. Good. And I tried one. There's a brand of paint that you can get called Sax S A X. Yes. Um, I think it's going out of production. Um, and it's the A P Fitzpatrick in Bethnal yeah. Green in London. That's where you could get it from. And I I got this Indian yellow, made manufactured by Sax, and the colour actually took me over. I've, I haven't had much of that. Uh, experience where you feel intoxicated by mm. the color and but this color it made me at one point i painted over this big interior i'd been working away partly because the painting hadn't gotten it didn't have a, much life to it and i probably didn't have any more canvas so i just covered it with this color because i wanted to see it and um yeah that's probably um, something I would, I'd like to get back to that uh, bravery. <laughs> it's brave. It felt brave, but just it's pretty stupid, really, because all it is is squeezing colour out of a tube and putting it onto a surface. Yeah. Do you, Do you find then you're becoming more cautious over time? Less I think brave. it's. I think it's inevitable over time to be cautious. Um, but as long as it as long as it feels like play at some point, you know, it's, mm. it has to get to that point of um, risk taking is one way to describe it, but that sounds a bit serious. But you know, it's more just you know, I wonder if I, you know, what would happen if I did that? Um, and I probably my outlet for a lot of that is in ground preparation mm. and. Cleaning a palette and just applying that to surfaces that are lying around, and then gradually altering those colours over time. That's that's probably where I um, 
enjoy paint. There's a purity to that um, messing about, Richard. It's just it's just pushing it around and um, and then letting it be, which is very different to the struggle of representation, especially when that's when it gets like I was painting grapes um, for a sort of anxious. 45 minutes earlier today and the grapes are red grapes but they're they're the greenest red grapes you've ever seen so the color shifts are um it's almost like you look at the grape and it's red you look away you look back and it's green and it's um <laughs> that kind of uh craziness <laughs> yeah. uh, but as long as you're a, a in absorbed it's absorbs absorption and attentiveness mm. is the aim and that's the process which leads to a feeling of being connected in some way um the and the image is always there isn't it you paint and run out of energy and then if you're lucky there's something to look at you put it on the wall and it, when you run out of energy you can still see it might not be the best time to look at something but it's it's that idea of um a bit of consolation in in yeah. the in the um activity it's that's um uh, rewarding but yeah maybe that's a bit optimistic because it's a lot of the time it doesn't work and you know it feels quite um discouraging painting yep um, very much so <laughs> very much so no, that's that, that a good thing about a class is that you get a bit of buoyancy and momentum with yeah. you know being around the other people doing it yeah so. because it is quite a um, a solitary business painting sure. um, yeah. and one needs that solitude to you know to do it and to to understand yeah. it more um, mm. i find for me going and teaching a few days a week or a few mornings yeah. a week it's really good because I'm still sort of um, it's involved with painting. It's talking about it. It's me doing a little bit, but that social interaction or yeah. stepping outside of my own myopic yeah. view is really really beneficial. Um, yeah, and helping other people, of course. I don't know if you find this as well, but um, sometimes if I'm doing a demonstration, I'll take something in that I'm having that I'm sort of struggling with say if I'm yeah. doing a commission or something so I'll try and do a demonstration and say that I'm trying to work this out yeah. and often can't and will say to people I'm struggling with this or and then to see them like solve some of those issues yeah. in their own pieces it's is heartening yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah just keeping it relevant is really important isn't it because if yeah. you know you need to you need to this is the hard thing i teach a class which has a structure for, as a model and i suppose the difficult thing is just thinking well not ever everyone in the room possibly every day wants to paint somebody you know so the subject is hard to uh but you know you get started and something yeah. happens um but yeah uh Especially looking at other artists, it's that's so. It's I mean, they say that you know you, we do art, we do painting because the other art exists. You know, if you you wouldn't if you hadn't seen paintings, you might not yeah. want to make a painting. I don't know. Um, yeah, and travel, a study and travel have um, really been important. I've you know you go to a museum in I don't know where was I years ago. Spain, I guess, and you know, you see a painting by a painter that you you felt like you've looked at a lot of their paintings. You, you're you're getting a relationship, and you see it in another country, and you know the familiar. Um, it's it's kind of reassuring that that it's it's I'm going to stumble into a nice cliche of. Talking about the individuality of a painter's voice, you know that sort of. But it's comforting to sort of check in with other painters to um, 
because it's a kind of definitely influences you know happening all the time in every um regard yes. but the um take people what 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 and someone likes and how that changes over time or doesn't change it's 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 quite interesting the the um you know why 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 i've got a jack Metti portrait on my ipad to remind me of you know what was he thinking while he was staring at this person and um yeah it's incredible incredible and it's interesting now because i didn't make that relation with your work and it documented being an influence but i definitely see it now you know, it can definitely... and Ken, Ken Howard said to me yeah. when I visited him that he he asked if I liked Giacometti. So that's uh -huh. um and he said to me, You're a portrait painter. <laughs> <laughs> and we, he kind of thought that it's you know, you should take one thing and try to stick with it. And but I I've having a rain I I looked at Cezanne a lot for when I was younger probably five years of regular um, searching, you know, trying to see a new picture. And there's, there's, there's even a catalogue resume online now, which is, I don't know if other artists have it, where you can see every painting, every drawing online. It's, you know, there's over a thousand images. That, you have to say so. Yeah. If you look up catalogue resume, it's... Uh -huh. um, quite new and just so um you know it has everything it's inspired yes yeah, so yeah. even so the i'm losing my thread but the yeah no, i've lost the thread well That's what fine. i was trying to say but um yeah i i Come back to those two painters for um, guidance, really, because they, they yeah. I mean, Cezanne, yeah, he had, he painted several subjects. You could say he was a landscape painter, but the um, still life, he probably had more of a um, response to his still lives in his lifetime because they were so thorough, I suppose, people could really see the, the work, but... Um, the, I, I was thinking as well, when I was on the drawing year, I think I was researching Giacometti's um, work and in, I remember being in the V&A Museum to, to look at their copy of uh, Paris Without End, Paris Sans Fin, that Giacometti worked on. And I just looked up before we did this today that it, he, was, he started it in 1957 and there's 150 lithographs that he would go outside and draw um, in this. And he, you know, he owned, it was still being um, organised at the time. You know, he died in 66, 65, 66. It was, uh, yeah, 66. And so it's very much, it was a commission really just to put together these drawings and they range in subject. Um, yeah, we think of Giacometti as the figure in sculpture, don't we, and the portraits in painting, but these drawings have got such a, um, you know, they, you really feel like you're seeing something through someone else's eyes, which is pretty, pretty good. And yeah, he, uh, I'm sure he ends up in bars and clubs as well while, while drawing away, which is. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed that when I was younger because, I mean, when, when you, the great thing about art and museums, you know, this great care that's taken to preserve um, the work of the past. You know, you get your gloves in the British Museum or something and handle the Michelangelo. Have you ever done anything like that? It's just so, um, yeah. it was a great thing to do the drawing year because they seem to have this um, connection with 
the London School, Eastern Road School, that um, really brought it to life. You could... Mm. Bomberg, um, people like that. Bomberg, yeah. Yeah, and there's a painter, an abstract painter that I like who has um, has has sort of made clear his mm. admiration of Bomberg. And it's, yeah. Yeah. You like Bomberg? Yeah, yeah I do. And uh, I mean, he was very influential as well. I mean, Auerbach and Leon Kossoff. Yeah. That's it, yeah. In, in all of these people since. Um, but yeah. yes, I do, I do, I do. Yeah. His, um, it, some of his uh, his paintings, his landscapes from when he travelled were really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, good. I was going to ask you about something you said earlier. When you discussed painting the seascape and having yeah. this, you know, strip of the coastline, which was shrinking in size and swelling it made yeah. me curious about whether you paint plan air and if you do then how much is plan air and how much goes back to the studio to be finished and yeah 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 it's it's a it's I, i'd say it's kind of fluid um but then with plan air like i've been out locally painting the church and there's a road with some trees nearby that i quite a big canvas out to to just try and work from observation and that's very different to push you know beginning a picture in the studio which um i suppose the difference feels like it's in the um specifics you know if you're like this one picture i'm thinking of has a has perspective with a road and houses receding. And um, I, if I was doing that from my head, it would be more generalised and um, being specifically having that um, one perspective, you know, things will be lining up that you probably couldn't have imagined before you went there and so trying to arrange that. But So that's it's hard to adjust that and retouch it and, open it up because it feels very specific if I brought it back and and it can I suppose it feels um it yeah it feels kind of closed and not open and that's the danger because you know I don't know what I feel about it and I want to get involved with it so I, I've been thinking about it for a few days putting a glaze over a picture made in Kensington Gardens, probably over the bottom half, because of the, when I was painting, I was very um, cautious or just uh, the touches were very small and um, I didn't get a hold of the overall uh, color or tone so but then because it feels like you, you can't get once you put a color on top of a an air study it feels it feels risky but i think i'll do it <laughs> i think talking about it's making me think that i shouldn't have been worried about it I should just try it and then you know it can only go wrong and you can always do another painting and, yeah, it, you got to try to open things up, and yeah, but, you know, the, it's always a compromise, isn't it? To some degree, that's the reality. Is you you have courage, especially when beginning, and it you're reduced to this sort of kind of worry, but um just a lot of doubt, doubt about an image. Um, and sometimes you can doubt the ones that you spend longer with. But it's hard because you, uh, over time, I trust more pictures that have got a steady construction over time. And, you know, I do this bit today and come back to it. And then I'll, I'll go a bit over here and this... 
I trust that the most, but it's quite rare that I can begin a picture with that uh, sense of measure. You know? so, um, do you find a question on that? Um, do you do you find that you're working on lots of different pieces at once? Um, that it's not say a, a linear thing that you start to paint it and you follow it all the way through but yeah, like you described there you, you've got a few you just adjust here and there yeah no it's totally chaotic and um it's not entirely random but i definitely don't know what i'm going to do each day at the back of my mind i've got possibly two or three pictures that you know if i was conscientious more conscientious i would you know pull them out put them up and make sure i at least look at them to think about the next move that i'm thinking about doing but i don't know it's um the first thing is just to get painting and a lot of the time it would be um something small or even drawing is a good thing to begin with because it's um i procrastinate a lot i give myself a hard time for not doing the kind of painting that i really think i should be doing whatever that means and i um, end up being tormented by these still life objects that i think i want to work from uh, one of your questions that you gave me was about what do you love to paint or what do you like to paint and the, the, the peach peaches is something that I joke with someone about it that it's i guess it's the warmth of their color their texture yeah. and you know the round the spherical they just seem to give themselves to painting you know you you, you observe two or three colors on a peach or two peaches and you start to mix and put those colors on and you know it's like painting a flower generally a flower will generally approve, improve a picture <laughs> um, but the the peaches I would buy this summer, I bought peaches, began something, and things were getting in the way, maybe other pictures or doing other things, and so they started rotting, so they <laughs> throw away the peaches, get some more peaches, put them out, and maybe even get to the point where I put the picture next to them and think, this is what I want to do. And I don't know, something interrupts the thread, the distraction. I, I just follow whatever I'm interested in at any point. So I'm sure I bought peaches three, three times at least. And they, it felt like they were accusing me, you know, these fruits in the room. They... Putting pressure on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Sounds it's interesting to hear, yeah. hear that because um, I've done it before where I've gone and bought flowers and uh, sort of got, because that was the instinct, you know, the instinct yeah. was to do it, that I want to do it, I should be painted still up, but, and I'd buy the flowers and then get them back to a studio, but then they're taken by something else. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I've said, well, I'm not really feeling the flowers right at this moment and it's yeah. sort of tricking myself in a way because you don't have to feel something to actually get on with it you know I was yeah. sort of deceiving myself in a way and then like with the peaches the, the, the flowers start to wilt and yeah. which I find quite interesting as well and sort of wilting yeah. flowers and it can kind of become symbolic of that thing that you've, sure. you've got now bought fresh flowers with it um, and dried yeah, Dried roses or peonies can the yeah. colour can actually improve when yeah. the way they change, probably to do with the saturation, I guess. But yeah. um, a lot of flowers I will take out of water, and they can they might not be the main subject of a new picture, but they can you can add them to arrangements, and it can give variety. Yeah. Um, so peach, so peaches are. You your favourite things when you get round to do 
<laughs> if I'm if I'm feeling wealthy, I'll probably buy peaches when I'm doing yeah. shopping. Yeah, you have to yeah. get a, a, a peach tree in your garden, and it be. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so Dan, your your wife Jessica is also a painter, which yeah. is so it's, you you're both painters, and yeah. I can imagine you there both both paint in a way. Do you have your own studios? In, in your yeah, studio? we do. Um, so front and back, this is south facing, she's north facing. No, other way around, this is north facing, she's south facing. Great. Um, but yeah, no, we look at, talk about, and um, exchange uh, thoughts regularly. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's, and going to shows, we want to go and see the uh, Rose Hilton. And Tony Eitan exhibitions before they finish. Yeah, great. Do you? Um, I I was saying this earlier about um, my friends who sort of mentored me down in Cornwall, and they were um, not married, but they were a couple. And yeah. um, I always used to find it fascinating that they'd go in for tea breaks, go into each other's studios, and sort of give this very yeah. honest critique, probably more them. honest than you know most people could, yeah. but because they knew yeah. each other. Really well, right? yeah. do, do you do you help each other in that way? Yeah, I think there's a you know instinct and trust that's uh, and sensitivity that's just continuous. It's part of a relationship. So we, um, if if you want a second opinion, it's useful to mm. have someone with the understanding. Definitely. Mm. Mm. Um, that's great. Um, and as I saw on your Instagram, or just just because you've been to Ireland recently, quite yeah, nice. yeah, we travelled. Just because parent, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the coast there is nice. It's quite it feels more wild than the UK. There's, there's a yeah. forest that ends up on the beach. Quite tall trees and um. At least always the light that's the light around water is always special and unique and um yeah, I'm glad for the time. Uh, Jessica she did some she plain air has always been a interest of hers and and the I've definitely done more being with her. I did a lot when I was younger, but the um it's a great um, way to spend the time to um, travel and paint the Do you find it gets kind of, sort of getting out of the studio and that plan yeah, yeah. experience is very helpful? Yeah, exercise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, things are never how you imagine them, are they? You, you return to a place that you want to carry on with a picture or you. Um, or imagining it looks a certain way, but it um, usually uh, has changed. Yes. And even when you're there, I mean, it's unlike the still life. I mean, you can mm. get sort of nuances of light changing, but yeah. the landscape or sky, sea, yeah. I mean, it, it changes within minutes, you know, and if, it, if you're painting, we've talked yeah. quite few plein air painters on here and it's always yeah. fascinating about yeah that. i've enjoyed you, listening yeah. yeah do you cap do you sort of get there and you try and capture the moment that you see straight away or do you capture the you know things as they're happening how, how do you approach them? um well i mean you've got the practicality of packing and arranging materials so usually it's fairly small scale and i always say in the class that it's better to have a choice than not have a choice so if you've got a range of boards and shapes and you're more likely to be able to fit the idea as it happens so i mean that's the that's the sort of skill that you practice being outside is this judgment of reaction and you know you you've gone to a place to paint a view but you observe the quality of lights that lend light that lends itself to 
the way you might go about making a picture. And so if something can be very, um, can work very well that isn't part of the intention. And um, um, yeah, so I mean, it's all part of it. Uh, yeah. And it's getting... all part of that, that practice in the sense that you can have the portraiture, the still life, the landscape, and they mm. they feed yeah. in each other. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's good to have an option, but the, I think the thing that's going to unify it for me, hopefully, is working from drawings because I want to do that more. Um, the difficulty is deciding what to paint. And um, I pulled out one drawing just before, you know, getting ready for the talk. And it's generally line drawing that I like to do because it um, there's a bit of tone in this drawing, but it's drawing of a figure that, um, you know, you respond to the marks when you're painting from a drawing. There's this great freedom and license in siding on colour and mixing the colour because you might remember something about the nature of the colour contrast. So I've got the light on the figure and something behind. And I think I trust more the colour, the decisions and mix, palette decisions that happen with. You know, when you're painting a still life, the um, immediacy and the challenge is really getting up to speed and matching that, what you're seeing. Um, but painting is always the same. When you're painting, when if I, this afternoon, got a, I mean, a lot of it's to do with preparation. So if I, I probably have an idea that this image I could, be through trying different things in the past, whether it was on a board or on a canvas, how how I'd go about deciding um, on the support would be probably a big part of it for me. I think that's maybe, I mean, I say to people in a class that this, what the picture is on is half of what people see. Maybe that's stretching it you know when you're making the picture that that difference in um, give of the canvas or the firm response of the board. So that that's really what I'm thinking about. And to make the colours from, from experience, I suppose, would be just as difficult as trying to match the painting the colours that you're seeing in the still life. Um, but I think it, I feel like you have to have more courage to attempt it from a drawing. And um, I suppose the one benefit of painting from drawings is that you can tell if it's not working. It's easier to know what isn't working because it's the whole thing is going to be, it's so sort of made up, I suppose, you know, that, that it's so artificial. The artificiality is heightened in the process, and yeah. At the same time, when you're without that um, information of working from life, something can feel less um, arresting, or mm. you know. But if your if your pictures are about, become about the paint and the um, you know what's happening across the surface, then. Yeah, it's hard to know what to do, but that's you know that's that's a good thing really to um, to to work on. It's that physicality that you're talking about there as well, um, the language of of the paint itself. Yeah, and but, the, the, that, that painter Truthfulness. I was just thinking of his images. Yeah. There's so much. There's a bit of sometimes they have um, the construction. You were talking earlier about the the way the picture is made being visible, and um, the first thought I have seen some of these pictures, they're a bit like late Monet or something, where the it kind of feels like the the brush has been put down mid thought, 
you know and you as you viewer you come into it and you think uh you're involved in the in the decision making process I thought i had something to say there but it kind of doesn't yeah <laughs> no that that is interesting that but but the viewer becomes sort of part of it you know but it is mm. that engagement on that level i've always been fascinated by the, the materiality of the paint and in particular yeah. paintings that show that physicality um you know and i think impressionism in a way because it sort of coincided with um you know the, the, the kind of the rise of photography in that sense yeah and the it, paint being in the tubes wasn't it yeah, around 1850 yeah. um yeah we've got timelines in the class, I was making a timeline of um, ah. female artists. So I was reading um, Katie Heffel's um, story of art without men, and ah, the, yeah, it's after eighteen fifty. There's suddenly, honestly, so many more painters that we are aware of than than yeah. before, which yeah. I think is to do with the paint being in a tube. Possibly. Yeah, the paint paint Probably. tube. I heard something as well the other day about the. Um, about flat brushes that they, they'd worked out how to, make, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to flatten them. But it also sort of coincided with, um, you know, photography in that sense. Yeah. It, but it become much um, more like accessible, not like it is today or in the 60s, 70s. But it meant that painting had to sort of, in a way, not so much compete or re respond, but it really developed its own language, your own yeah. way of seeing the world. And then you get, yeah. you know, impressionism as a, as a symbol of that. And that, mm. that physicality, because when I, I grew up, like most of us sort of, we thought that, you know, paintings had to kind of look like photographs or whatever, yeah, you know, the kid in yeah. the class that could make something look exactly like a photograph was like mm. the best artist, but, that appreciation more for paint, for brush marks, for the human hand really, mm. really developed in me as, a, as I looked at more paintings and understood yeah. a bit more about that history. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Simon, do, do you have a question? Uh, I suppose I was wondering about um, when you talk about the kind of uh, procrastination that you wrestle with is there any benefit that you think you can glean from procrastination because that can be quite an important part of the process you know you're preserving your energy <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> is there any development of the considerations of images or wants or yeah i think so i mean they say that about travel don't they and if you I've heard people talk about stopping painting and I, it never appealed to me the idea of going through, you know, an enforced period of time without painting. Um, but I can imagine a situation, it was a bit bleak, but I can imagine a situation where, you know, there were no more canvases. There was, you know, it, <laughs> the last canvas that was available, you know, what, and you know, you've been, you're going to paint it, but you, the choice of subject is it's pretty important you know to, um but the the activity and the absorption is has become the main thing i focus on and um yeah i mean i i very much view it as work in progress the whole time and i think that that's the only thing that gives me hope is to think thought of getting better. And a lot of the time that thought is about trying to combine more elements in a picture. Um, I think back to a painting I made on my foundation course that had, I think I combined all these different sources, you know, and, um, photography, drawing, painting from life. It was quite a small picture, but, and there was about six figures in it or something. So it was just something that I, it, it stayed with me, the, 
the, you know, how did I get the idea? How did I go about doing it? I, yeah, just, I, I mean, the thing with age is that you, you know, you're kind of attempting to recreate a, um, an invention that might be, you know, it's more staged, if you like, more artificial, because it's, you're recreating something that's already passed. And um, I guess the, yeah, the other consolation of painting is, is that it can be this calm accumulation of observations. But, uh, so it's, it, you're constantly thinking about painting. Like Simon was saying, procrastination in that sense. I think procrastination is, it is for me anyway, very much part of the, yeah. the process that paint, you know, painters aren't when they turn up to the studio, they start painting mm. from 8 a.m. until 8 at night. Mm. There's lots of staring out the window for me and lots of sort of walking around yeah. the block. And <laughs> But I'm still thinking about painting. Are you the same? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I um probably actively try to get away from it. Um, quite rarely, really, because most of the time it just feels comfortable in in a good way. That um if I if I want to, I can start a painting. That's the the. That's the the urge, isn't it? Just yeah. to have access and the materials and yeah. Um, but the idea of having a vision, you know, and seeing something that you want to paint, you want to remake, is that's um. I suppose it's rarer. You know, you might only have a handful of images in your lifetime, really, that you from start to finish feel quite um like you've originated them and they and you've brought them to some sort of conclusion. Um do you yeah, have many, doesn't often, but... do you have many I mean I always hate this question when people ask me if I don't hate it, but um, I often don't know how to answer it. Do, um do you have a favourite painting or are there a few that you would you would say look this is um a, you know a real success and you can see where like you were saying earlier you sort of sometimes feel like you should be painting some you know almost something else some other way are there any paintings where you you are very proud and, and you can see? um right uh, <laughs> i'm not sure because i really do try to keep going and keep looking ahead um, and having an exhibition approaching helps because your your working time is spent in imagining what it could possibly look like you know to walk into a space that you know where the pictures are going to be and you i wouldn't say you're designing a show because that's feels it doesn't actually feel like that because when you paint you're just involved and it's kind of like a um it's like you have to, you have to get lost you have to the confusion has to um uh increase before the order can sort of be reasserted but um uh, I, I suppose if there's a, a, I'm more proud of something that felt, um, uh, I, I mean, it has to be, there's a picture of an interior with a figure in it that felt like one of the first pictures that I had kind of pieced together and I don't think I knew it at the time, but when I saw Bonnard's 
glass and bowl of milk you know that painting that the Tate yeah. Tate Modern has it and yeah. and there are all these these drawings that he did to piece it together and I I suppose I felt like I was imitating that but without the knowledge of that mm. painting if I think about the process and there's but then um, I suppose a figure in a room um there's it's complexity but I, when I thought of that, when you first asked, I immediately thought of something that is very different. So the a flower painting, probably that I did a week ago, mm. that um, you know I haven't shared it on social media, but the, that might also equally feel like an achievement, probably because of the. Um, some memory of the the state I got into while making it. You know, it felt um, sometimes it does feel like you just take yourself out of the process. I I think it's you know something that's been said a lot through at art school and since when you when you start painting you're in a room full of all the people who've uh, criticised or commented or I think it's Philip Guston that this comes from. But, and one by one, that you keep painting and the people leave. You know this yeah. one? Yeah. And then gradually you leave. <laughs> yeah. And once you're out of the way, yeah. that's when the painting just sort of starts. And, you know, that can happen um, quickly. There's no, there's no, um, there's, you know, uh, I mean, your sense, your own sense of value about what you've done is, is a tricky one, but uh, yeah, I could roll up those canvases and put them in one little bag and have a mm -hmm. box of drawings, and that would be okay, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, interesting with because I often reflect on that um, thing. I mean, I don't, you know, have favorite paintings, but I do see paintings that were, let's say, sort of breakthroughs. Yeah, I was about to say that when you started talking yeah. just now, I thought. It's when something changes, and that's yeah. that's what you're marking, isn't it? With a yeah, yeah, image. and it's you can see that shift, or you do, and it's it often comes, you know, accidentally or or, or you know, just through mm. practice. Um, I was uh, the other day I had to free up some space on my iPad, so I had to go back and look at all of the old photos and just seeing yeah. work from you know 2019, 2020. Or whatever, and thinking, God, you know, mm. and I think I had that. It's hard for an artist to have an objective view of their own work, you know. Yeah. And I often say this when I'm teaching, and people yeah. say, oh, but that little brush mark is so rubbish. I said, Look, you can't see it holistically because you're, you know, every little part of it. Yeah. So I went back and looked at this old work, and I did for, you know, a split second or two see it kind of objectively. But could also see then that um, sort of arc that I'd been on and thought, oh, actually, I am getting somewhere because a lot of yeah. this stuff is awful, you know, from my own perspective. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it's sometimes very hard for us to see as artists that sort of mm. our own kind of development through time. Yeah. yeah. Um... Yeah, because even if you get two mirrors and put them together, it's yeah. still, um, you know, that kind of reflection, which is different to a single mirror. Um, yeah, still. You, uh, you mentioned exhibitions earlier. One of the things yeah. we do like to do is to make sure that the audience who are listening or watching know where to go to support or see your work. Do you have exhibitions coming up or... Any social yeah. media you want to promote for people to go and see and support you and your yeah. Work. So next May two thousand and twenty four, um, I'll be doing an exhibition in Dulwich in the one five five A gallery with um, Karen Smith is the gallerist there. Um, so that exhibition is what I'm painting towards now. Um, I landscape, still life, and portrait. We'll figure in it. Um, yeah. Uh, 
two rooms. There's an upstairs and downstairs. So um, the range of pictures. And I went, it's the first solo exhibition since the last time I had just my paintings in a place was 2016, I think. So um, trying to enjoy it and um, uh, trying to be bolder, thinking of um, artists I admire. But, you know, you look at their painting, I'm thinking of Lucy Jones again. I'm, I can hold her painting in my mind and I don't think she felt fear. She must have gone through a process, but uh, painting is um, uh, it's inspiring to, to think of. It's helping me to right now to think about um, working larger painting studio based landscapes. That's, that's um, yeah. Excellent. And aside from the that exhibition is there anywhere do you have a website or anywhere you'd like the viewers or listeners to go to support you is it instagram or is there other platforms that you'd like to promote yep instagram's the most um regular most frequently updated um i have a website which is just my name daniel shadbolt um the new english art club website is probably probably um a another space to see paintings um, yes, I think that's New English Art Club. Mm -hmm. You'll find it if you put in New English Art Club. I'll put the links in the description of this video. But yeah, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I really appreciate being able to well, talk to you. It's been lovely. Nice to see you and talk to you here. Um, uh, I was going to ask you about your music. Um, <laughs> I can see a guitar. Yeah, well, that's... And uh, a plectrum. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. a work in progress, that one. So, <laughs> you ever pull it out on screen? No, 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 I'm not at that level yet. I could do a little on the ukulele, but the guitar is... Uh, yeah. I've only done a couple of pieces with, and that was for a specific uh, promotion for an exhibition this year. But yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the music is something I'll be making a video about at some point soon. So if you are subscribed, which I appreciate to, uh, to yeah. my, you'll see yeah, that. Yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can't live without music. It's totally a part of my life. And um, absolutely, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Lovely to meet you, Dan. You too, Richard. What do you play? Uh, me? No, I don't. Yeah. I listen. I listen to a lot. Knife. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I always wanted to play guitar, but I was too impatient when I was younger you know, to okay. to learn. Do, what instruments do you play? Um, I've been trying to learn piano, but I played guitar since I was a teenager, uh, and um, was in a band. Uh, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's uh, very much a hobby. Mm. Wait, yeah. There may be a potential collaboration there. Yeah. Between, <laughs> yeah. That's a musical side project. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. But yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Dan. It's great no, to thanks talk. Thanks for asking me, and um, it's I enjoyed it. It's uh, good. It's I like the uh, space you create with the podcast. Thanks so much. Thank Cheers. You.